So welcome, please, Stuart and Sven. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Here you go. I will start off. Yes, the mic is on. I, had, I was requested to do this speech, uh, not on the last minute, but I was requested to, uh, to, to replace somebody else. I have prepared something, uh, especially for the first slides, and um, hearing the, the previous speaker, I have decided to just maybe skip that a little bit. Um, this morning I was introduced to, to two people by Stuart. I worked at Fokker for four years, and the persons I was introduced to have uh, a lot of experience in the aviation industry, so I don't think there's a much new I can tell them. And for the other people in the room, um, I think there's a lot of IT specialists, so also I don't think there's a lot of that I can bring them. What I can tell is what I am here in the project for, is uh, for Fokker is that I'm about business architecture and process management. And what I look at is processes that we do, and I will uh, next I will I will explain the, the, the problem case, the, the case at hand, where we stand, and then Stuart will explain where we're going um, and, and explain it. Um, and I can see how IT can help us uh, with this, with this, with this, with this situation we're in. So I press down for the next one. No. Room. On the right. Okay. Thank you. So a short. A short situation where what we do at Fokker, we don't build entire airplanes anymore, but we are a tier one supplier for several companies. And let's see the picture is not not as I uh, as I had it in, in my in my presentation. On the right is an Airbus, Air, uh, Airbus A380, and one example of uh, innovations that we do. Just one example. You see a lot of things that we do for the Joint Strike Fighter and the A380, and there are several other programs, just one, one example, is glare technology. And glare technology is uh, glass-reinforced aluminum, and that makes a very light and strong uh, uh, connection. And without this innovation, the A380 uh, wouldn't even be able to, would be so heavy, it wouldn't be able to lift off. And there's a lot of uh, innovations going on in our field, of course. On the same, uh, uh, on the same moment, we are building on a, on a, on a, a company that's, that's evolving slowly. We are, uh, and, and I'm from a quality uh, department, so I'm focusing on the quality perspective. Um, we're building on, on, a, on a system with old old IT systems, several uh, uh, somewhat connected IT systems. Um, we have an IRP system, of course, and then we can manage our production. And if then something happens and we have an anomaly, then we have another system, a quality system, where we should add that. So at one point, we are very uh, uh, innovative, and at another point, we're maybe a bit slowly. And that means also, and, and I'll show you in the next slide, we're doing a lot still by hand, a lot of record keeping in our company because quality is so essential, of course. My point of view, quality, that's why I have this. If I would be an operations manager, he would have a euro or dollar signs and he would say it's so costly the way we work. And that's, that's what we're trying to change. So this is where we're at right now. We have process instructions. They are, there are barcodes on it, and there is, is connected to systems, but there's still there's paper, paper documents. And these paper documents travel with the product through the factory. And on these documents, we put our stamps, and then it becomes a record. Every item that we use in the, in, in the production line has to be traceable. Every action that we perform has to be verified, checked, and that we do by hand. 
we check the product and we check the paperwork if the engineer who, who was uh, uh, performing the job has done all the work according to the instructions. And then in the end, we have a record. We have created a, a valuable record. It has to be traceable, so we scan it and it becomes a PDF and we go to archive because we have to be traceable for as long as the, the airplane is, is out there, is flying. Maybe not so very efficient, uh, but it's traceable. Now what if, if you want to change something, if you want to change the configuration, or if you want to change the planning, and you have the paper instruction on the floor. Well, I was looking for a picture with somebody with running shoes, but you better put on your running shoes, because you have to go to the floor and take away this, 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 this instructions and then hand out new ones. Problem is that the product is already half finished, so the instruction has become a, a, a record with all stamps on it, so you also have to keep the, the current record and then go on with the new one. Same for planning, if you want to, somebody uh, to do some other job. Quality, quality control, what I explained to you, a lot of done by hand, what could be done maybe by automatic. Production process, well, I make it a little bit worse, the black box, than it is, but at some point we don't know exactly what the progress is of, of a product. Not as much as we want it to be. And traceability. This is a requirement, not just a customer requirement, also from the authorities. And we can do that, but give us some time to find the correct record in some cases. This is the program we're in. We are now in the first stage, all digital, and we're digitizing all this, this documentation and records that we are doing. So we have to find something to replace the pen and the stamp and, and connect it to the process um, that we're working on. And one of the things that's so interesting in this, in this process we're in, in this phase we're in right now, is that we just find out that uh, 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 open text fields and paper is very willing. You can write down everything on it. And we thought we were very structured, and it looks on paper very structured and very, very efficient, but you can write down everything and you can change everything. And if you have a stamp and you're authorized to change something, you can do that. So we're witnessing all different areas where we have to find something, a system that can cover all this so we can still work the same the way we can, but then digital. And that was very interesting with the, the previous speaker, with Ron Toledo, that I'm thinking now, um, I hope our project it doesn't end up as one of the elephants that he showed us. Any which one. So this is what we're going to. The next uh, pres the, the con presentation continues with Stuart. And this is what we want. We have a separate machines, old machines, that are not connected to our uh, network, where we still have to, well, it's not that floppy, but we still have to, it's disconnected and have maybe put a USB stick in with the right configuration for the machine settings. And we want it to be connected, so we can stop the process from push of a button instead of the running shoes. We want the process information, digital available, so it can be changed automatically, and the operator only sees the the actual format and not the paper format, but what can be changed. We want digital sign-off, so the quality control inspector, for example, doesn't have to check if, if all the stamps are there because the system can do that for him and he can concentrate on the, on the product itself. And then if everything's digital, well, I hope archiving could be a very a much more efficient. And then I think Stuart will say something that a data lake will emerge and we can do all smart things with those. And this is where I give it to Stuart then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my role is, uh, yeah, lead architect sounds terribly important, um, but um, let's say the central architect in a fairly distributed project, there are 
various partners involved, all different parts of the organisation. It's an innovative, innovative project. Um, there are a lot of things that quite genuinely emerge. One of the roles of an architect, maybe the most important in all of this, is herding the elephants. So, um, uh, Sven told you about the first phase. The first phase is simply digitising everything. Um, that does deliver business value. I'm going to talk about it a little, but it gets interesting really later on because that's where we're going. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through these first few slides. All we did was we took a look at um, the different areas in which we would be developing what is actually do revolutionary, there is no information technology in these areas at the moment. We are bringing that in. And we just plotted things on a model. This actually comes from Gartner with these three layers of um, systems of record, systems of differentiation, systems of innovation. There are so many versions of this model. Um, but we just had a look at, okay, what are we doing where? Where do we expect things to change most suddenly? What, in terms of systems of record, do we have to continue supporting, etc., etc.? And the things with the uh, red dots around them are the areas in which um, we're developing things that um, don't exist, or if they exist, they're on paper, in people's heads, in emails, on Excel spreadsheets. That's about as digital as it gets. Um, and uh, nothing revolutionary about that. We then figured out what kind of component architecture we wanted to have on this, what was going to go where. Um, and uh, then we took, around, took a look around at what products were available in the market and what things we needed to develop ourselves, where we could reuse, where we could um, modif sorry, modify, um, and where we were going to have to do our own work, um, and we plotted that on that. So this is, I would hope for most people, a fairly familiar approach to things. Um, you can see we stuck some middleware there, but the idea that that's just a layer isn't the point. It's more to do with how things communicate. So. What makes it interesting is the vision of the future, um, where we're looking. The situation that Sven described, the most obvious thing that's wrong with that is it doesn't scale. Um, there's no way that you can do anything um, new. There's no way that you can scale up your production processes, be more efficient, be more effective, um, be more creative. Um, we need to head towards a world, we are heading towards a world, part of the vision, for example, of inter industrial internet of, or of industry 4.0, nothing, that's a German term, we've adopted it here for Fokker, industry 4.0. Um, and um, so we're looking at a world in which we have smart machines that are talking to smart products. So instead of people rolling things across the floor, um, looking for bits of paper to see what it is, scanning barcodes to see um, what the instruction should be, reading it off a screen, then going to the machines, calling a program that then gets loaded. The machine knows what its job is. Um, it is autonomous. In fact, the processes are more or less autonomous at the moment, but um, they're not self uh, they're not self managing. We're looking at self managing machines that communicate with products that, okay, a layer of composite plastic doesn't probably will never have intelligence embedded into it. It will be accompanied by what we're referring to as an avatar. So in our first phase, we were producing digital shadows of these products. So instead of bits of paper, there will be a digital, digital shadow that represents that product. Eventually, there will be an avatar that has intelligence that could communicate with the machine, say, here I am, this is what you're supposed to do with me, and the machine knows how they're supposed to do that with that kind of thing. Um, so we're looking at an autonomous and cooperative um, intelligence between things, which of course will require vast amounts of um, of business intelligence and that's where the data lake and everything else comes in or whatever it's called by the time we get to that point because as Ron says we might not be talking about data lakes in five or ten years time we might be talking about other things but the idea is where we need to go we have to deliver real-time insight and creativity there will be people involved there'll probably be more people involved because we'll be able to scale up uh, but people will be doing different things they will be interactively interacting intelligently um, with um, what we can deliver from the machinery. Um, and what's involved are, as now, the operators on the floor, the planners who are constantly busy 
trying to optimise changing situations, logistics who have to deliver from one place to the other, and of course management who have their own interests in being able to watch it. And in this picture that you can see lots of sensors and things floating around um, and the idea of digital intelligence there and the machines, the, the products that know where they're going, etc. And these pictures are important because in a sense this is what our architecture is about. Um, as I think I said, yeah, no, sorry, just go back. But this is what the architecture is about. It's about the actual things that are happening on the floor. It's about the real production processes that are why this company, which is Fokker, um, is what it is. They're not supporting underpinning services. They are actually part of the thing. And in order to make that mean something to the users who are not IT geeks, but are actually operators who will be doing this stuff, maybe we need to be producing pictures like this rather than pictures with lines and boxes in them. But having said that, here's a picture with lines and boxes in it. Um, again, this is more in line with the vision um, than a kind of typical layered architecture sort of picture. Because here you can see pieces of software that are actually representing those smart machines, smart products that we're heading for in the future, smart planning. Um, and these things called job managers are, let's say, in the future, they would be the machines that are carrying out the business processes, which are the orange things at the top. Um, this is one particular factory within the Fokker area that produces composites. That happens to be our prototype. In the end, every possible manufacturing process involved with Fokker, as well as um, the relationships with suppliers and with our customers, will all come into the total picture. But you have to start somewhere. We're starting here. So these job manager things represent um, the, um, the actual processes and the thing called the DPD manager, sorry, a DPD is it's Dutch, but it means the document that you have to deliver at the end. But this is representing the product and you'll see there are interesting things like identification. What is this? Where is it? Location that all come along. So we've tried to model our architecture on that future picture, even though first phase is just, haha, just about digitizing. This is not an IT project. This is a business project. It's got to do with the world that Ron was just talking about. We're not doing IT separately for the business. We're not doing IT business alliance uh, alignment. We are developing this as one big group. All different parts of the business are involved from the commercial side of business management through logistics to the people who actually operate the machines uh, on the floor, the people who lay pieces of composite on top of each other, who use the programs that are developed to guide that, etc. <coughs> Their team leaders, the planners, the quality people, everybody is involved in this and in designing it um, and IT is just part of it. Um, so, yeah, what, are our, what do we have to do with the architecture now? Well, it has to be business driven. I think I just said that. It's got to be future ready, but it's got to work now because if we deliver this thing in January to the floor, which we are going to do, and it doesn't work, we can forget about the rest because this is not just a piece of IT software that if it doesn't work well, you can do something else instead. This is actually a manufacturing process. If this doesn't work, Fokker are going to fail to produce things that their customers have ordered. Big, big problem. So it has to work. But we can't just concentrate on that because we've got to be able to grow towards the future. We've got to be able to support the stakeholders at all parts of the organisation that are actually having to deal with change because this will change how people work. Um, there's actually part of our activities which is to do with the management of change, with helping people to learn how to use the new way of working with helping us to understand what they would need to do in order to be able to work with that. Um, it needs to be open, it needs to be flexible, it will be. It will also be as standardised as we can possibly get um, within the, uh, the constraints that we have and within ter in terms of what's available. And it has to be innovation friendly. It will continue to change. It is changing right now. As I said, I am herding elephants or possibly cats, but elephants are a bit easier. Um, more or less every day. 
Um, I can't just go and do a nice architecture picture and then go to some team and say it's going to be like that, guys, because that isn't the way the, the world is when we're doing these kind of projects. Um, so I and Sven as well, to a considerable extent, are busy with bringing people together, with making sure that they can continue to innovate, to work in an agile way, and we can still make the whole thing work. I shan't go through the whole list of stakeholders, um, but it's very important to understand that the operators, for example, they're not just the classic end users that IT tends to see. They are fundamental stakeholders because they're the people who are actually doing this stuff down on the floor, the floor and it has to do with the, the core work of the organisation. Of course, they're team leaders as well. Everybody has slightly different requirements. One of the things with the operators, and not alone, only the operators, is you know, here we are, we're starting off on a road towards um, automating more and more things. People are going to be wondering what happens to my job. Um, and their jobs will change. Their jobs will change. There's no question about that. Machines will take over part of what they do. Their intelligence will take over other roles that we can't fill at the moment because we don't have the information to do it with. We will scale up. There will be more work. But people need to believe in this. They need to see that it actually makes their job better and doesn't undermine their future. And right down at the bottom, you'll see IT or the CIO. Um, CIO is just another stakeholder. Um, he has quite a lot of influence, but he's still just another stakeholder and he has different concerns. He's concerned about his total, total cost of operation, so we have to make it cheaper for him um, to deliver the IT services that um, underpin all of this um, than, uh, than it is at the moment. He's concerned about his reputation as a supplier and he's concerned about whether he has a future as well. Um, and that's, yeah, we have to address all these things, obviously various business people. Um, and everybody has their own, um, their own concerns. Now, that shouldn't be news to any um, enterprise architect, but I personally have never worked on a project coming out of an IT world as I do, in which we have so many business stakeholders who are not just people who say, well, I care about this and we take it away and we put it into a map somewhere and we see what happened. But we have to work with these people every day and they see whether we're delivering this to them or not. Oops. That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, see, technology only works if you attach it properly to your body um, or swallow it. Um, OK, so what are our main architecture challenges? Um, we have to be able to, as I said, maintain this future, vision of the future in an innovative environment where people are coming up with their new ideas, where to some extent the wheel is being reinvented every day. People are discovering things that they should have known we'd already discovered, but that happens in an innovative, innovative world. People are developing solutions for a problem that somebody else was working on. It happens. That's part of working in an innovative environment, in an agile environment, in a co-creative environment. We can't simply tell everybody in advance exactly what they've got to do and as our number of involved parties increases that will be even more so but that's a minor problem um, we're having to um, ask questions about how we what does security mean in this environment we're putting information technology in areas where there was no information technology at all um, we're, we're creating new types of users um, of uh, the information technology that didn't exist before. They had no reason to use any of this. Um, and it's an interesting little challenge for us that the existing security policies have never thought about this. Um, so how exactly are we going to remain compliant? Because the biggest thing in, 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 uh, in the aerospace business is actually being compliant with the rules that are imposed on you by somebody who's not interested in how you solve it, uh, only that it's got to be like this. And compliance means going for the safest possible solution, not necessarily the best one. So that's an interesting challenge. Um, bigger still. Um, when this thing runs, 
it's got to deliver visibility of the uh, of operations but across a whole set of heterogeneous and, and autonomous processes. Um, we're not, we don't have a, um, a conductor there do, conducting an orchestration the whole time saying you do this, you do that. Some manufacturing industries can do that because they have products that roll across the line in a predictable fashion. Our products have a different order of being handled um, at different parts of the line. That's inherent. Uh, in, in how that production system works. I'm sure it's true for any aerospace company or for any builder of high value, low volume kind of um, products. Um, and so the, the optimal order of processing changes between processes. So you can't just say that, that, that and push the thing across. But we have to maintain the, vi the visibility. And that's an interesting, almost um, data science kind of challenge of what kind of information do people need, what do they want to have and how do we want to present that to them because it's not simply a question of saying what's your requirement because they don't know what their requirement is because they haven't dealt with it yet. Um, so it's all, um, it's an interesting challenge and it's fun. And we're replacing paper. So now when a product goes over the floor it has this pile of paper that follows it across. And that means that when that thing arrives at a particular station, you know what it is. It's got a pile of paper on top of it. It says, I'm, I'm, I'm this. And when it moves across, further across where um, uh, bits of it get, um, get cut off, so you can't just stick something on it and say, that's it, um, then you've still got to be able to do that all the way. And you've also got to be able to find it as we move out into other parts of the operation, more into logistics. You've got to be able to find it. Um, so there's a challenge that we're having to deal with. How can we make sure that you can uniquely identify something that's got no label, no sticker on it? Um, and that's where the sensor technology is coming into this. We'll probably start with something very simple, just like RFID. But at some point, we're going to have to get and will get a lot smarter because we want to collect more information. We want to be able to do more things with this. And Really, everybody in this room ought to know this, but it surprises me how many people again and again don't seem to realise that you can't just digitise a manual process. When you make it digital, you work differently. It is different. And if you start with, with, with people, the idea from, what's this on paper? Well, we'll do one of them. Sven pointed out we had that problem trying to translate that paper um, into a pure electronic form. But the whole way of working changes. And if you try which you can, of course, because you can write programs to do anything. If you try to simply digitise that manual process, you're going to make a mess which won't deliver any advantages. It'll just be paper that's slightly harder to find. And one other thing that's very important is what a uh, term that I didn't know before, but referring to tribal knowledge. People on the floor, from the operators to the team leaders to the planners, they know so much about that environment. They see things. They've seen it before. They understand, oh, that's a one of those. Um, years ago, um, many years ago, I was working as a summer job in, um, uh, in the laboratory to a lamp factory, a fluorescent lamp factory. Um, and we used to take our products down onto the floor from time to time to get them uh, processed, our experimental products. Um, and one of the things I saw there was all these lamps would go across the floor um, and sometimes you'd get a bit of a log jam. And if you didn't do something about that log jam, quickly, then it would spew lamps out all over the world. Um, so there used to be a man who would run in with a broom handle and smash enough lamps to make the whole thing continue properly. Um, this was a very effective thing. It was part of tribal knowledge. Somebody recognised a situation developing that was going to have to be dealt with and knew how to deal with it. Now, we're dealing with slightly more complicated situation than that, but we still have to be able to do that. So how do we collect that tribal knowledge which makes sure that things work as well as possible now on the floor and get that into some kind of digital form. And I'll tell you, we don't actually know the answer to that yet. You know, that's not going to be in phase one, but it's one of the things we're going to have to work on because if we lose that, if we digitise it all and we fail to take the tribal knowledge with it, then we will not have effective processes. Once again, we are not delivering an IT system, we are digitising a factory. And that's a fundamentally different thing. And for me, it's a bit of a dream come true because finally I'm actually doing business IT instead of IT for business. Um, 
also important the different kind of artifacts or we use for communication um, I have no intention of talking to these but you can see at the top there on the left hand side um, is a fairly happens to be Archimate um, a fairly recognizable architects kind of thing um, and then on, on the top at the right there is a business process model which is part of Sven, Sven's work that he does and as it happens both of these things are produced by Biz Design Architect there's an advert for Biz Design if they're in the room um, and um, then we make various other um, kinds of models in order to be able to communicate with different kinds of, of, um, of parties in this because people in the business don't want, certainly don't want the top left picture. The top right picture is useful to them but it's, not, it's still not quite their, their territory. They need something that reflects what they actually see. So the thing down the bottom in the middle is um, simply a map of the factory um, where you would produce, where you um, have sensors that were traveling around so that you'd be able to locate things which is important and then the thing bottom right is actually more intended for um, for IT management that they can see something that they recognize a bunch of applications that they've heard of which sit in the back office that communicate with our modern Fokker 4.0 world I find that difficult to say in English Fokker 4. no okay so um, I suspect that's all I wanted to say. Yes, it is. So um, we're open for questions. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I'll come and join you. We have. Uh... Which one of us is the pussycat? <coughs> oh, that's Martin's cat. Must be Martin's cat. Has to be. I'm joining you. So we, we uh, have, some, have some questions, I think. Um, asking the, the um, questions is uh, Chris Ford, the Open Group uh, VP of Architecture and uh, General Manager for Asia Pacific for us. So uh, you have several, Chris? Yeah, we have, we have several questions. It's, it's interesting to hear the conversation because in the past year I've been over in uh, China with uh, AVIC who is the aerospace organization there, and it's very similar sorts of conversations, right, about uh, the industrialization of, uh, uh, digitization of their, their business. So w one of the questions is, how far will Farker extend, quote, the factory? Because you're digitizing things, so what is the concept of the factory to Farker in this vision? Do, do you mean, do we include the supply chain, or? Uh, yes. I'm not going to presume, I'm asking the... Okay, okay, so uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, uh, what we focus on for now, and, and, and not trying to, to go into this uh, fantasy elephant, is that we're first uh, starting with our own factory on, on the different sites, the different facilities, um, and starting to digitize our own processes, and then make that smarter, as, as, it, as was explained. And then in the next phase, yes, it is uh, the, the obvious next thing is to include the suppliers and customers and having customers or connect to the system of the customers and having suppliers connecting to our systems. They, they, I think you will uh, know that we have similar systems like uh, portals where supplier, supplier portals can enter the system, but that's not, that's not integrating, that's just an, uh, an interface and connection. So the next phase will be that. Uh, for example, as Stuart explained, um, the smart products, if in the future products will be, and it, it should be a customer requirement then, because we cannot build chips in the, in, the, in the products that we deliver if the customer didn't require them. But if, we, if they would be required, we could have, a, for example, an RFID chip in a, a, a flap or product and keep it alive and deliver it as required with the chip and then it could follow the whole life cycle of the product from the factory on the way in, in flight and collect data f from uh, uh, all the time. Yeah, this is actually this hits, a, uh, hits the related question which is, you know, aircraft uh, last 50 years or more and as you build these, you reference the smart product capability. Um, do you imagine that an extended governance model between you and other yeah. parts suppliers, yeah. these sorts of things? But that's not up to us. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we cannot build in chips if they're not required. Actually, they would be sending back the, the products. 
but at the supply end to us there is a, an intent so the, the factory that um, where the initial um, pilot project is taking place deals in um, in composites um, based on thermoplastics um, and the suppliers of thermoplastics are in in the same region um, but the the communication is a bit standard old-fashioned kind of communication uh, and one of the key things about thermoplastics is they have a limited lifetime when they're not in the freezer or they haven't been baked um, and we can follow them now within or we will be able to follow them within the Fokker territory but not before that and one of the phases of a parallel project that's going on that's connected to ours will be to get to the point where um, the the sensors that follow that start in the factory where the thermoplastics are made and travel with that through the whole lifetime. Um, in going from this uh, paper-based environment to an entirely digital workspace, how have you been managing change management and how are the architects, the extended architect team, I assume, involved in the, in the program or the process? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, one of the things that um, we discovered uh, was that the, the systems in which um, the design engineers work to design um, both well, what they call recipes for making specific products um, and, and the processes that those have to follow, um, those are no longer suitable for what we're trying to do. In fact, we discovered that they've been wanting to change this for years, so we're a bit of a dream come true for them. Uh, so we're moving to a completely new um, design system for that in which change control is obviously fundamentally important because you really need to know exactly which version of which bit of which bit you're working with. And how, how are you managing the, the volume or the, the value of the uh, continuous changes? Is that it, as you move again into this digital space, you mentioned there are a lot of challenges, but how are you managing the, the continuous change process? You're not going to be doing sneaker net anymore, right? You're not running around the factory picking things. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, of course, that that's what happens right now. It's people running around the factory changing things on the, um, on the fly. Um, but, um, yeah, well, continuous change, again, the, that, um, the, the, the tool that's in, that the engineers use is that's completely fundamental in this because there is any way continuous change taking place there. Um, it can be down to a fault has been found enough times in a particular product that um, Sven's people and others decide, OK, we're going to have to make a change to that, so there's a change made. That can come onto the floor in the middle of a process. The changes that we're introducing that are, let's say, more purely the IT side of things um, needs to be... Um, it's, it's a, you know, it is a challenge because they've got to be dropped into a production environment so we can do all kinds of tests on them but at a certain point we've got to be able to, div um, to drop those in and in worst case pull them out again. Um, but it, it will simply be continuous change. We're going to keep a, our initial f um, prototype phase has been more than a year but as we move on that's going to have to get sharper and sharper. You, you, you had a list of challenges that you have not yet had the uh, opportunity, perhaps, to address. Have you, have you visibility to challenges that there simply isn't an answer for yet, that you've looked at and said, the capability to manage a, f a shop floor like this, software-wise, autonomously, just doesn't exist yet, and how are we going to get to that? That, that? That's the nature of the question. Are there areas that you've looked at enough to know there simply is no answer in the industry yet for what the vision is calling for for your company. Your, your um, I'd say the, uh, the avatar thing that I was talking about, we're a long way from being there. Um, you could do it, of course. I mean, you know, there's nothing that would stop you from sitting down and writing some code to do that. Um, but it's not that there, there's, there's no software simply available to do that. And they come, there are other interesting challenges associated once you try to do that because you've got to make sure that that avatar doesn't lose the product that it's supposed to be associated with that's one um, i mentioned the um uh, the tribal knowledge that isn't 
a trivial thing and we don't yet know exactly how we're going to deal with it. So that security we have to fix. We will make sure that there is at least um, enough, enough security to cover us from compliance and then we'll work from there out. But I think those two things, the avatars, digital shadow we can do, that's what we are doing. But actually making avatars um, and being able to collect that human intelligence and make it digitally available um, those are our key challenges, key long-term challenges, I think. And how do you see the workforce, the human workforce's role changing in this kind of digital factory environment? Step by step, they're, they're changing step by step. At, at this moment, we are discussing with the people from planning, scheduling, and they are thinking in the way they work, and then they are thinking in how would that be digitized, so what I do now is uh, extract the plan from the ERP system and then create Excel sheets. And, uh, and that's not optimized. We have different plannings, planners for different uh, stages in the factory. So you can imagine people are optimizing for their part, but not for the whole chain. And they know that, and they know that that's a problem, but this is this the best they can do then. Um, so how we involve them in this project is that we ask them how they would want a system uh, to work. And then how they respond is that they are presenting the system that how they work now, but then in Excel sheet, in, instead of Excel sheets, it should be digital in, in a user interface, user friendly, uh, somewhere, or something like that. Instead of thinking beyond and saying we want, not now, but in, in the next phase, we want an intelligent, uh, a d a d we want a database wh wh which knows from all the products in the on the floor and the master schedule of which product should have priority over the next to meet the, the demand. <coughs> and instead of you creating sheets for the factory to tell people what to do, or at least the, the schedule, um, the system should provide a schedule and you should be uh, tuning the parameters uh, to make it to optimize that schedule. But the, 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 the IT system should uh, find all the data, have all the data, and make an analysis, and then come up with the best plan. And you, as a planner, should not be making plans. You should be optimizing the system to make the most the best plan. And we're helping them to see that. That and, and this is an example of how their role is changing. Now they see themselves as planners making plans, but they should be planners optimizing the planning, the planning system. This is one example, yeah. That's the end of the floor questions. Thank you, Chris, and that, uh, that's all we have time for to uh, make sure that people get a chance for coffee. But um, thank you once again, Stuart and Sven. Um,